Hi guys, welcome to Minute Med. In this video, we will be speaking about inflammatory bowel disease or IBD, which is an important part in gastroenterology. So we will be speaking about the etiology, the pathology, the clinical presentations, complications, uh, lab endoscopy and radiological imaging. And also at the end, we will have a small recap summary for you. So IBD is a chronic GI disease that is quite prevalent. This disorder has overlapping pathological characteristics so the precise etiology of IBD is still debated, although most mechanisms involve genetic, environmental, immune and microbiome factors. So you know we have intestinal microflora or microorganisms that normally live in our gut. So the etiology of IBD can be summarized as dysregulated immune response to host intestinal microflora. So this bacteria which lives in the gut can cause a hyperactive immune response in our body which can cause inflammation. So patients with IBD usually present with fever, fatigue, abdominal pain and diarrhea, sometimes bloody. Two major players in IBD are ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So let's dive into ulcerative colitis first. Ulcerative colitis is characterized by recurring episodes of inflammation limited to mucosal layer of the colon. While Crohn's disease can affect any part of our intestines, ulcerative colitis only affects the sigmoid colon, the rectum and the anus. In fact, ulcerative colitis almost always involves the rectum. Ulcerative colitis spreads proximally from rectum in a continuous pattern and from there the disease will spread up the colon. So what are the main pathological features of ulcerative colitis inflammation? The inflammation in ulcerative colitis is continuous in contrast to the patchy lesions in CD or Crohn's disease. You can find superficial erosion or ulcers which involve only the mucosa and the submucosa. Unlike Crohn's disease, no serosa or muscularis is involved here. We can notice thinning of the colonic wall. Another one of the main pathological findings of ulcerative colitis is that the colon normally loses its normal hostra or the wave-like projections inside the colon and this gives a lead pipe appearance in contrast enema imaging. The involved colonic mucosa can show extensive broad-based ulcers. These ulcers affect the colon and the rectum so much that it makes the normal parts of the colon look abnormal. These isolated islands of the regenerative mucosa surrounded by parts of the inflamed colon will appear raised, giving them a so-called pseudopolyp appearance. On histology, we can see mucosal edema, congestion, inflammatory infiltrates and crypt abscesses. So over here in figure A, we have an endoscopic view of severe ulcerative colitis with ulceration. So in figure B over here, we have a complete colectomy with, uh, which shows active disease and with red granular mucosa in the cecum, the left side of it. And in figure C over here, we can see a sharp demarcation between active ulcerative colitis which is at the bottom and the normal mucosa at the top. And in D, this full thickness histologic section shows that ulcerative colitis is limited to the mucosa only. Let's talk about the common patterns of disease distribution in inflammatory bowel disease. So when we speak about the common patterns of disease distribution in UC, majority of them, around 40-50% to 50 have proctitis, which is the most common location in the sigmoid colon and around 30 to 40 percent have left-sided colitis which involves the whole of descending colon and in 20 percent of cases the whole colon is involved which is extensive colitis. When prevalence is concerned in ulcerative colitis it is more prevalent in North America and Europe and usually the age of onset is between 15 to 40 years so it's very common in young people. So what are the clinical features and symptoms of ulcerative colitis? Patients with ulcerative colitis almost always presents with diarrhea, sometimes with blood. And there is mucus in stools and bowel movements are frequent and small in volume as a result of rectal inflammation. Apart from that, these patients commonly present with abdominal pain classically on the left side which reflects the location of the distal sigmoid colon. They will also have fever because of the inflammation vomiting due to abnormal bowel movements and because of impaired digestion, they will have weight loss. 
Upon examination, there will be abdominal rebound tenderness and sometimes in severe cases, there will be abdominal wall rigidity. They will also present with arthritis, many joint pains and hepatic and bile duct complications like gallstones. One of the unique extra-intestinal manifestations of ulcerative colitis is primary sclerosing cholangitis which is an autoimmune disorder of intra and extra hepatic biliary ducts. We can also see pyoderma and erythema which are rashes in the skin and also ocular complications like conjunctivitis and sores or ulcers in the mouth. The complications of ulcerative colitis so the most important complication of ulcerative colitis is toxic megacolon. That's when the inflammation extends to the colonic smooth muscle which results in smooth muscle paralysis ultimately ending up with colonic dilation and symptomatic systemic toxicity. If the colon is dilated more than 6 cm we consider it as toxic megacolon condition. Toxic megacolon leaves the colon in such a weakened state that perforation is such a common consequence. And this perforation can result in massive colon hemorrhage which is less than 3% in incidence. But if it's too severe, this can lead to hypovolemic shock. Also, it is important to know that ulcerative colitis increases the risk of colon cancer even more than Crohn's disease. But the risk of cancer development is directly proportional to the severity and the duration of the disease. Let's talk about the lab findings in an ulcerative colitis patient. So when we do a blood test, we can see low hemoglobin and albumin levels. Low hemoglobin because of the loss of blood with stools. And low albumin because the colon cannot do the protein digestion function properly now because it's uh, impaired. So blood albumin level will also be low. On the other hand, we will have a CRP or C-reactive protein and ESR increment because it's an indication of inflammation. And if we take a stool specimen, we can see mucus bloody stools. And the patient will sometimes be positive for PNK and ASCA. PNK stands for perinuclear antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies and ASCA stands for antisaccharomyces cerevisiae antibodies, which is often present in ulcerative colitis. Endoscopy and radiological findings. So when we do an endoscopy, we can see diffuse erythema, mucosal edema and the loss of fine vascular patterns and there's a granular appearance with mucosal bleeding and strictures but strictures are very common in Crohn's disease so there's a standard endoscopic grading of ulcerative colitis from 0 to 4 0 being normal and 4 being the most severe case which is ulceration this can be used to grade an ulcerative colitis patient this is a plain abdominal x-ray showing a grossly dilated colon due to severe ulcerative colitis. So if it's dilated more than 6 cm, it's a toxic megacolon condition. And in the second picture over here, the hostra of the colon have disappeared and the normal wave-like appearance of the colon is gone and the colon looks straightened. So this is the lead pipe appearance. In more severe chronic cases of ulcerative colitis, a benign stricture in the transverse colon of the patient can be seen. There is also something called the Triller van Witt Severity Index for ulcerative colitis, which categorizes ulcerative colitis as mild, moderate, and severe, depending on the frequency of defecation, the bloody stools, the presence and absence of fever, tachycardia, anemia, etc. So it's classified as severe ulcerative colitis if the frequency of defecation per day is 6 times or more and the FIFA level is 37.5 degrees or higher. So what are the differential diagnoses of ulcerative colitis? Number one is obviously Crohn's disease which is very similar to ulcerative colitis except that Crohn's disease occurs in all the layers of the GI tract. And then we have infectious colitis, intestinal lymphoma, intestinal tuberculosis and irritable bowel syndrome which are also differential diagnoses of ulcerative colitis. When surgery is considered, it's important to distinguish CD from UC because CD involves all the layers of the GI tract. Right, that's about it for ulcerative colitis. Let's dive into the other player of inflammatory bowel disease which is Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is a unique chronic condition with recurrent patchy transmural lesions from the mouth to anus, especially in the terminal ileum. 
Crohn's disease is unique and it can affect any part of the GI tract as opposed to ulcerative colitis which affects only the rectum and the colon. Crohn's disease is an autoimmune disease so it has more systemic side effects than ulcerative colitis and usually there's years of recurrent inflammation. What is meant by transmural is that it involves all the layers of the GI tract and not just the mucosa and submucosa. Upon histology observation, we can see multiple separate areas of the disease which are skip lesions. We can also see non-cachiating granulomas. And we can see after sulcers in the mouth and in the esophagus. The linear deep pulses which connect often give the bubble a cobblestone appearance which is a characteristic feature of Crohn's disease. So this occurs because the diseased tissue is depressed and is below the level of the normal mucosa, giving a cobblestone-like appearance. And we can also observe creeping fat, which occurs when the mesenteric fat, the kind that naturally develops in the abdominal area, wraps around the bubble wall, causing it to thicken. So the location of, Crohn so the location of Crohn's disease involves the whole GI tract from the mouth to the anus, but the terminal ileum is the most common site and more than 75% of cases develop within people whose ages are between 11 to 35. Let's take a look at the clinical features and symptoms of Crohn's disease. So chronic inflammatory disease can be seen with diarrhea, sometimes it can be bloody and low-grade fever and abdominal mass due to impaired digestion and also weight loss due to malnutrition. Due to intestinal obstruction, we can notice postprandial bloating, cramping pains, and loud boborygmi, which are intestinal rumbling sounds caused due to moving gas. Perianal disease is very common in Crohn's disease because the anus is affected. Anal fissures, fistulization, and abscesses can occur. Patients with CD can develop fistulization due to transmural inflammation, which can lead to epithelialization across the bubble wall. Fistulas are abnormal connections between two epithelialized surfaces. In this case, abnormal connections may form between the bubble and other organs. Erythema nodosum and pyoderma gangrenosum are very common skin conditions in Crohn's disease. So, erythema nodosum are painful nodular erythematous rashes usually seen on shins. So, this is caused by circulating immune complexes which generate a reaction in the fat cells under the skin which leads to a classic nodular formation in histology. We can also see non-cachiating granulomas. Pyoderma gangrenosum is due to abnormal neutrophils. Patients with Crohn's disease will often complain about joint pains, ulcers in the mouth, inflammation in the eye, and hepatobiliary conditions like acute fatty liver. Kidney stones and thromboembolic conditions are also sometimes seen. There are types of Crohn's disease based on the site. So a majority of people, around 40%, have their lesions concentrated in the iliocolonic area and around 30-40% to 40 in the small intestinal area. And around 20% will have Crohn's colitis and less than 10% will have perianal disease alone. The most common extraintestinal manifestation of IBD is arthritis in large joints. When it affects multiple joints at once, it's called migratory polyarthritis. And when arthritis affects the spine, it's called sacroiliitis and spondylitis. This condition can result in severe back pain. During lab investigation in Crohn's disease, the blood test will be positive for ASCA. And sometimes we will have a low serum albumin level due to impaired digestion and a low RBC count and an increase in the ESR and CRP levels, which indicates inflammation and a stool sample may show blood in stools. These are some pictures of the gross pathology of Crohn's disease. Figure A represents a small intestinal stricture and B shows some linear mucosal ulcers and thickened intestinal wall and the cobblestone appearance. And C shows creeping fat or fat wrapping around the intestines. When observing microscopic pathology of Crohn's disease, in, we can see some crypts being formed and in B, we can see non-cachiating granulomas. And in C, we have a slide of transmural Crohn's disease with submucosal and serosal granulomas. This is a barium follow-through showing terminal ileal Crohn's disease. And we can see strictures, the locations A and B, which are caused due to intestinal obstructions. 
This is known as the characteristic string sign in Crohn's disease. These are some more imaging of the small bubble in Crohn's disease. In A, we can see an ulcerated stricture with pre-stenotic dilation. And in picture B, we can see an endoscopy picture of an ileal ulcer in a patient with Crohn's disease. And in C, we can observe a bubble wall thickening of the terminal ileum and active inflammation. And in picture D, it's another capsule endoscopy showing ileal Crohn's disease stricture. So to sum up the complications of Crohn's disease, we can see some abscesses and fistulas and colonic cancer. And when the entire bubble wall is swollen or inflamed, it can narrow the lumen which can appear as fibrotic strictures. All of these complications can lead to the patient presenting with tender abdominal mass, fever, leukocytosis, perianal disease, hemorrhage, malabsorption and weight loss. Let's take a look at the differential diagnosis of Crohn's disease. The number one differential diagnosis is ulcerative colitis which is very similar to Crohn's disease. Intestinal lymphoma is another differential diagnosis and the gold standard to differentiate intestinal lymphoma from Crohn's disease is to do a colonoscopy biopsy. Intestinal tuberculosis is another very important differential diagnosis. Upon biopsy histological observation, we can observe cachiating granulomas in intestinal tuberculosis and non-cachiating granulomas in Crohn's disease. So we can use this difference to differentiate Crohn's disease from intestinal tuberculosis. And other differential diagnoses include colon cancer, ischemic colitis, diverticulitis, and irritable bubble syndrome. Alright, to sum up, this is just a simple diagram showing the main pathological differences between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Though they are very similar, they have some significant differences among them. So now let's go to a recap summary of inflammatory bowel disease. The location of ulcerative colitis is the distal colon with rectal involvement. While in Crohn's disease, the whole GI tract is involved. In ulcerative colitis, the gross morphology will show mucosa and submucosal ulcers with pseudopolyps and the loss of hostra leading to the lead pipe site. And in Crohn's disease, we can observe transmural inflammation which involves all the layers of the GI tract which is the cause for fistulas to occur in Crohn's disease. And we can see cobblestone mucosa and bubble wall thickening and the string sign due to strictures also aphthous linear ulcers and fissures. In ulcerative colitis, upon microscopic morphology in ulcerative colitis, we can see crypt abscesses and ulcers but no granulomas, while in Crohn's disease, we can see non-cachiating granulomas and lymphoid aggregates. Fulminant colitis, toxic megacolon and perforation are some of the complications of ulcerative colitis, while in Crohn's disease, we can see fistulas, and strictures causing more obstruction and also perianal disease. While malabsorption, malnutrition and colorectal cancer are some of the common complications for both. When we speak about the intestinal manifestations, ulcerative colitis patient may present with bloody diarrhea while in Crohn's disease they may or may not have bloody diarrhea. When speaking about the special extraintestinal manifestations, in ulcerative colitis sclerosing cholangitis is very important and in Crohn's disease, kidney stones and gallstones are important. But rash, pyoderma gangrenosum, erythema nodosum, eye inflammation and arthritis is common to both conditions. Right, that's about it for inflammatory bowel disease. If you manage to learn something new, please subscribe and hit the like button. And if you would like to learn about any other topic in detail, please do comment down below. Also, don't forget to check out our next video on inflammatory bubble disease management and we will also have a case discussion video for you. Thank you for watching.